Crypto holds the potential for everyday people to make life-changing money. But one of the trickiest parts of this whole space is how do you hold on to your crypto? Do you hold it on exchange? Do you keep it in MetaMask some other way? Because the last thing that you want to do is get hacked and lose your seat on this rocket ship. Now, lots of people choose to hold their funds in a hardware wallet because they think that's the safest option. But last week, a major hardware manufacturer, Ledger, just introduced a big firmware update that could put your funds at risk. And everywhere I look online, people are absolutely enraged by this. And in this video, I want to break down everything that you need to understand as a blockchain developer myself who works this technology, including hardware wallets on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. On this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And while I am a crypto holder myself, the best way to make life-changing money in this space is to change your career and become a blockchain developer and increase your earning potential. And I can show you how to do that over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, so let's jump into this major ledger fiasco that everybody's angry about online. So whenever people get in the crypto space, they're always trying to think like, hey, where should I store my crypto? Should I keep it on an exchange? Should I use my own wallet? Should I use my own hardware wallet? And that becomes a popular option for many people because it gives them a sense of security that you have this device, okay, where you can keep crypto on it and your private keys, you know, the things that authorize the transfer of your cryptocurrency, never leave the device. And the only way someone could steal your crypto or abscond with it in any way, whether it's from government seizure, is to have the physical device itself or the recovery phrase associated with that device and have whatever PIN number that you've programmed in to authorize those transfers and actually click the button on the physical device. And one of the most popular hardware manufacturers in this space, Ledger, has been providing this value to many people for many years in the crypto space as long as I've been here. But just last week, they introduced a new firmware update that could completely compromise this value proposition and potentially even put your funds at risk. Let me explain why. So just last week, Ledger introduced a new feature called Ledger Recover that's supposed to help people in case they lose access to their seed phrase or the ability to you know use their hardware wallet anyway, that they're going to help you recover access to this so that you can regain your funds. Now, the problem with this is how this feature is architected is it takes the private key or parts of the seed phrase and then actually sends them to a remote server so they can assist in this process. And that's a massive red flag for so many people in the crypto space. And that's exactly what they're furious about. So let me show you how that's going to work. So the whole design proposition of a hardware wallet is that you connect this physical device right here that you plug into your computer. And anytime you want to transfer your funds, okay, you must have this physical device, okay? And you put in a pin code and then click a button on the device that authorizes the transfer. You must have the computer and the wallet and then that, you know, sends a transaction to the blockchain. Now, what makes this possible is that the private key, the thing that lets you send a transaction, like your password in the blockchain, stays on the device itself. Your computer can't read it. No remote server can read it. It's sort of the whole point of, you know, custodying your own funds on this physical device. Now, with this new update with Ledger Recover, the whole design here is to take your private keys and send it to a remote server, okay? So now you don't have this closed system of a hardware wallet that can only authorize transactions. You have the private key of this device leaving the device and going to a server. And that really breaks the design of a hardware wallet in the first place. And that's what people are so up in arms about. So let's explain exactly why everyone's so upset in case you don't really understand, or maybe you don't understand all the potential risks that are associated with this. Well, first and foremost, it breaks the old adage in crypto of not your keys, not your crypto. Like the sole value proposition of a hardware wallet in the first place is you have a place to store your keys that no one else for any reason can ever access except you. So it's not really your keys anymore. And so in case you still still don't understand why that could be a problem. That's okay if you don't. I don't expect everyone to be an expert in this space. I am an educator. That's why I'm here to tell you these things. The vulnerabilities really lie in the private keys being on this remote server. Now, I know they could be broken up into multiple shards. They could be encrypted. They can do all this type of stuff, but there still are several failure points, and I want to clearly outline those right now. So number one, there could be some type of internal risk at Ledger itself. Now, very clear in this video, I'm not making this video to throw Ledger under the bus more than that in a minute. I'm not calling them bad actors, but I want to clearly out on the risks here. So if you have the information out there in any form to reconstruct your private keys, there could be some type of internal problem where a bad actor internally at Ledger could reconstruct your private keys and essentially abscond with your funds. Now, again, I'm not saying that they're going to do this, but the whole problem here is now that you have to trust that they're not going to do this. And that's one of the value propositions of tri crypto in the first place is that, you know, it's a trustless way. You don't have to trust somebody else to do what they say they're going to do, okay? And in addition to this, all the software that runs Ledger and the firmware on the wallet, it's closed source. So there's all this additional layers of trust here. And another reason I think people are scared about this is this is not the first time that we've seen people just 
in an instant run off with crypto. We saw the collapse of FTX happen last November. It was a massive trusted party in the space until some really bad news came out that they weren't so trustworthy and then everybody's money was poof gone. Now let's say none of that happens. Let's say that everyone who ever has ever worked at Ledger as an any type of security clearance, you know, is 100% squeaky clean, isn't going to do that. And let's even say it's a safe assumption. Well, there's another attack vector here, which is an external attack, okay? You have to be absolutely sure that no external hacker could infiltrate their systems in any way and then also get access to your private keys or the ingredients that are needed to reconstruct your private keys to then go take your funds. Basically, bottom line is this is a massive centralized honeypot for hackers and they are going to try whatever they can to infiltrate these systems because they know they can make a massive amount of money by hacking every single wallet who's ever opted in to Ledger Recover. And I'm not saying that they are going to be successful in this, but I can guarantee you they are going to try as soon as people have opted in this feature and it's 100% live. All right, now the third major risk here is potentially government seizure of your funds. Okay, so let's assume that everyone who's ever worked at Ledger or Squeaky Clean is not going to touch your money. Let's assume that's a safe assumption. And let's assume no hackers can ever be successful at taking your money. Well, what happens when a government entity comes knocking and says, hey, we're going to subpoena, you know, X person's crypto. Well, are they going to comply with that? Are they just going to hand over your keys? And then, well, guess what? You don't have access to your money anymore because now a government has taken it. Well, that is a very likely vector here. And I have seen some chatter on Reddit that supposedly from the co-founder and former CEO of Ledger. Okay, I actually can't find the link to the original post, so I can't 100% guarantee whether this is totally legit or not. But if this post is legit and we can take it at face value, then they're saying basically if you are a recovery user and you have your shard into safeguard by third parties, then yes, a government could subpoena them and get access to your funds. So I'm telling you right now, that is a real potential risk. And if this post is true, then they are admitting that that is a real potential risk. Now that's an overview of the potential security risks with this new ledger recover feature where your private keys are leaving your device and getting stored in the cloud, at least the ingredients to reconstruct your private keys. Now on top of that, people are absolutely livid because this is going to require KYC or know your customer registration, which basically means that if you want to use this feature and, and use this update, that essentially you have to give over identity information like your passport so they can verify your identity so they can you know recover your funds on your behalf. Now, this has got a lot of people mad because they're like, hey, I want to use a hardware wallet. I don't want to have my identity information connected with this in any way. And that can be lots of reasons for this. Sure, some people want to remain completely anonymous with crypto for nefarious purposes, but there are some people who just want to remain anonymous because they want to remain anonymous online. They want their privacy respected and they don't want their ID information just sitting in a million different places off the web. But in order to use this, you have to give over your ID documents to make it work. Now, an important point of clarification in this whole process is that this is an opt-in feature, okay? So basically, you don't have to use Ledger Recover if you want to continue using a Ledger hardware wallet, okay? You don't have to give over your KYC user registration information if you want to continue using your Ledger as is. But this has led to so many other concerns from other people like, okay, let's say I don't want to opt into Ledger Recover. Is there something about the architecture of this hardware wallet now that could still let people, you know, remotely access the information to get my private key in any way? Now, we've seen that fear floating around online and Ledger has responded and clarified that there is no backdoor feature inside the hardware wallet where they could recover your crypto somehow from your device, whether you've opted into the feature or not. But it really goes back to the issue of trust that now that people are kind of scared about, hey, what is Ledger doing? They just have to trust that you're say you're going to do this and that you're actually going to do what you say. Now, again, I've said this multiple times in the video. I'm not saying that you shouldn't trust Ledger. I'm not making this video to throw them under the bus or anything. I'm mostly reflecting back people's concerns online and educating exactly how this works. Because there's all these red flags with trust right now. People still have a slight bit of PTSD from what happened with FTX back in November. And they don't really have a major appetite to just trust what people are doing inside their crypto space. And stack that on top of what happened with Ledger in the past, okay... They had a data breach, which essentially exposed data about 270,000 crypto wallet purchasers, okay? So the whole idea was like, when you purchase a ledger, you gave them information about like your name, your email, and where to ship the wallet to. And all the information was exposed in a hat. And we saw all these crazy stories of people basically like receiving emails with their you know address in it with threats, saying if they didn't comply with the threats, they were going to do something bad. So we've seen issues like this with Ledger happen in the past, and there's just a growing sense of mistrust from the community. Now, I want to be 100% fair to Ledger, okay, because I'm not making this video to say don't use Ledger or do use Ledger. 
Again, I'm an educator. I just want you to know what you're getting into if you decide to use any of this technology or any of the products in this industry. Okay, but I'm going to be fair to Ledger. So they are holding a community AMA to address these concerns and sort of settle the score on what the issues are, take the feedback and go from there. They realize that they've opened a massive can of worms. I have a feeling they anticipated that this was going to happen before they rolled this feature out. So if you want to make your voice heard, you want to hear everything straight from the horse's mouth, then you can, of course, attend these Ledger AMAs where they're going to take the feedback and address anything, any concerns that you might have. And if you have a good solution on how to rectify this issue going forward, then you could, of course, make your concerns known here. Now, if you are a Ledger hardware wallet user, or maybe you're thinking about getting a Ledger, or maybe you're just trying to figure out what's the best way to custody your crypto, what can you do about this? <laughs> okay, so some people will just continue to lose use Ledger. Okay, they might just say, I don't really care. Okay. I'm just, maybe I don't hold enough crypto to really be concerned about it. Or, you know, I just don't ultimately trust myself. I need to trust somebody. And this is the best trade off for me. That's perfectly fine. You can choose to do whatever you want to. I just want you to have all the information because I think one of the reasons people like hardware wallets in the first place is they like having their hardware, you know, their crypto on a device that I can tamper with. But at the end of the day, I think people don't trust themselves. Okay. They, they don't trust themselves to back up their seed phrase properly. They're worried it's going to compromise in some way. And they actually want this type of recovery feature where someone could, you know, potentially help recover their funds remotely. And so if you want to do that, by all means, do it. But you must clearly understand what the trade-offs are. But what are some different alternatives? Okay, so one really popular alternative to the Ledger hardware wallet is the Trezor. Okay, so why do people sometimes prefer the Trezor over the Ledger? Well, it's because the Trezor is 100% open source. All right. So you can actually get on GitHub and you can read through the code of the firmware of the Trezor device itself. Now, that has several benefits. Like maybe you're watching this video and like, okay, that's cool, but I can't read the code. All right. Why, why would that matter? Well, it's good for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's lots of people out there who can read the code. So there's a big incentive if you're a hacker and you think, oh, I could maybe hack all the treasure walls out there. I'm going to go see what the open source code looks like. You've already got people trying to do this and nobody's been successful at that today. And now on the white hat side of things, there's lots of people who care about the success of the treasure community and they can go look through the code and see if there's any type of vulnerabilities and disclose them so they can get patched up. And third, it's just a massive transparency that increases the trust in the device itself because any security person can go through and read through this code and make sure there's no backdoors in here where someone could recover your seed phrase. There's no vulnerability abilities or somebody could come in and just, you know, wipe out all your crypto. And you don't really have that benefit with a completely closed source alternative like Ledger. Now, some of the other obvious alternatives are you could just hold your cryptocurrency on a centralized exchange, you know, like Coinbase, for example. Okay. Some people just prefer to do this because again, they want things to be simple and they don't trust themselves. They would rather trust somebody else. And maybe the amount of crypto that they're holding on there is not that significant to them. So they're willing to take the risk, okay? Or maybe they're holding just a portion of their crypto on there. Maybe they're using some other you know, alternative for longer term storage that they don't want to mess with, okay? Other options, you can do the same type of thing in MetaMask, okay? You are controlling your private key and your device that's not on a centralized exchange. This, of course, has other uh, potential security issues with it, okay? All someone has to do is open your computer and click a button to transfer funds out of your wallet. But still, some people prefer to do this for the simplicity and maybe the amount of money they're holding in there is not that consequential. But if you're watching this channel and you're a little bit more technically minded, okay, you're more advanced user of the blockchain or you're a coder already or want to be a coder, there's some other options for you. So one is that you could just, you know, generate your own key pair, all right? And then store your crypto funds that way and never put it into a piece of software like MetaMask, maybe never even put it into a hardware wallet, okay? You can do that. So if you have any type of you know programming skills, you could run your own key pair generator on your computer. You could keep it with a JSON key store file, for example, that's password protected. That way, you know, your private key is never even stored in plain text on your device. You could also just generate the private key and keep it in a safe location, like write it down on a piece of paper or even memorize it. And finally, you could use what's called a multi-signature wallet, okay? And this actually is probably a compelling alternative to hardware wallets for more technically minded people. Okay, it kind of gives you the big benefit that Harbor Wells provide in a little different way. And so recently, Vitalik Buterin himself, you know, the mastermind behind Ethereum, uh, ha has, has been discussing this as a good opportunity uh, ever since everything happened with the Ledger disaster. So basically what a multi-signature wallet is, is it's a smart contract based wallet. Okay, you send crypto to the smart contract itself, and then that has multiple signers. Okay, so it works kind of like a hardware wallet in that way, where essentially 
you know, hardware wallets kind of like a multi-signature in the first place. So you typically have a software interface where you're going to authorize transfers and you have a second signature on your device where you click, you know, sign on your computer. You're not really signing anything, but you're saying, yes, I want to do it. And then you're creating a second opt-in on a physical device. You need both things. So it's kind of like two signatures in that way. But a hardware wallet's a little bit different. You actually need multiple unique private keys to sign a transaction in order to release funds. So essentially you set up a smart contract wallet and then you could have like five different private keys that essentially can authorize transfers. And all you need is three of the five private keys to actually do a successful transfer. Or you could do two of three. You can set up multiple schemes where you need a majority of signers in order to release funds. Now, a lot of people do multi-sig wallets whenever you have an organization where you have lots of different people who must authorize transfer, but you can also just do it for yourself, okay? You can set up a multi-signature wallet where let's say you have a MetaMask account, all right, that must be a signer, and then maybe you keep a MetaMask on a different computer, or maybe you have a key pair you've generated and you memorize a private key, or maybe you even use a hardware wallet as a different signer, or maybe you can have a different person who you trust be a signer. There's all different ways where you can come up with schemes for custody your own personal crypto funds with a multi-sig just like this. All right, so that's an overview of the massive fiasco that's been happening with the Ledger wallet over the past week or so, what everybody's absolutely up in arms about, and what you need to understand based on this. So again, I'm not making this video throw Ledger under the bus, say do use Ledger, don't use Ledger. That's all the information and you can decide what to do for yourself. So I hope you like this video. You know, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that I'm able to learn about blockchain. And again, while I am a crypto holder myself, I think that's a great opportunity in this space. The best way to make life-changing money with crypto in the long run is to become a blockchain developer, break into the industry, get all the opportunities from working inside the industry and also increase your salary. I should do that, you know, well past 100K over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You really don't have to be an expert to get started right now. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dappuniversity.